Hello and welcome to the Doki Pen channel. I'm Dan and this is where we make computer graphics videos on game dev, shader writing, programming, maths, physics. In this video we'll be deconstructing the equations behind a method used in computer graphics to approximate the behavior of ocean waves. I previously uploaded a live stream of me creating this technique in Unreal Engine and for some reason Despite it being very long and lacking in some crucial details, it's still my most popular video. I've since gone over this technique and revisited it, and I'm presenting the ideas behind it in a more prepared manner. So this is a new style of video that I'm creating. So please let me know if it's something that you want to see more of. Um, please leave comments if you'd like. If you want to support me, then please subscribe to the channel. That really helps. Uh, then please visit my Patreon page and you can help me make more videos like this. So the inspiration for this came from a chapter in the NVIDIA book, GPU Gems, which is available for free in the link below. So what are Gosner waves? They're a technique to approximate the way that waves in the ocean appear, how they propagate and how they move and how they interact with other waves. And we assume that the reason that the ocean looks like it does with its sometimes turbulent appearance is actually due to multiple waves traveling in multiple directions. So that at any one point, the height is actually due to a combination of multiple waves that kind of add up together to increase or decrease the height of the ocean surface. So you might think that the water particles are kind of actually moving with the wave. And we'll kind of later on discover that that's not the case. The particles kind of just stay in a kind of local area. And this local behavior concept is actually useful to us because we can first start to think about the movement of the ocean surface in just the vertical direction only, mainly because it's a lot easier to think about at first and it gives us a solid initial understanding before we then later add on horizontal side to side movement. So it turns out that the familiar look of a wave traveling isn't actually water traveling with the wave itself. What we see is something that emerges out of the underlying local behavior of the water. So we'll be using the popular and powerful Houdini software to illustrate the waves and we'll use the VEX language to express the operation we'll be performing on the geometry. So we can start by imagining an ideal single wave traveling in a certain direction. And for simplicity, we'll start by modeling a single wave in just two dimensions where the number line represents distance in some direction and the vertical axis will represent the height of the wave. And we'll come to a 3D ocean surface later on in the video, but keeping it 2D as we begin really simplifies things as we dive into the equations, which as it turns out, aren't actually that hard. Now we're gonna switch over into Houdini. Um, so let's do that. So in Houdini here, I'm gonna create a line with this line node and in its properties, I'm gonna change its direction to one zero zero to make it align along the X axis. And I'm gonna change the length to 20 meters and that's enough to see the period or cycle of the way we're gonna be creating at least a couple of times. And we'll change the number of points to 100, which will allow us to see enough detail. And we can display the points in the display options here. And if you wanna see this side view, then we'll change the camera to the front camera. We can model a simple wave by using a sine function and plugging in the position along the number line as the input into the sine function. The output of this will be what we'll interpret as the height of the wave. So I'm gonna create an attribute wrangle node and we'll set the position attribute directly by assigning to the special Houdini variable P, which you can access with the at symbol. This should give us the familiar sine wave appearance. And there we go. Are we done? Well, not quite yet. We still don't have a moving wave. It's currently not very interesting as waves generally appear like they're traveling. How about we do that by subtracting a constant that increases with time? The rate of increase to the input of the sine function is analogous to the speed of the wave. We can think of this as moving the wave as all we are doing is offsetting its position that is being used to generate the wave height. But remember, the wave that we see isn't traveling at all. It just looks like it is. If we look closer, all we're doing is changing the height of each individual point on the surface to go up and down. It just so happens that because we used a sine wave and changed input, that it looks like it's traveling. We can also control the distance between the peaks here by specifying the distance. This distance between two peaks is called the wavelength, and it would be nice to be able to specify that with a common unit like meters. 
Since the sine function itself generates its characteristic waves with a period or cycle that goes from 0 to 2 times pi between successive peaks and then it repeats, we can multiply the input to the function by 2 times pi to make the peaks line up with 1 and 2 and so on on the number line. There will be more on this 2 times pi factor in a moment. In Houdini, we can include math.h, which has a definition of pi in it for us. If you're coding in a different environment or language, then you can define pi yourself. This shifts or squashes the range to fit the peaks into a nice repeating pattern that aligns with the whole numbers on the axis. We might need to increase the number of points on the line though to resolve enough detail to see the function properly. We can also reduce its length to only see a few cycles now. If we zoom in, we can clearly see that the peaks are lining up with 1 and 2 and 3 and so on. I'm going to add a little control here so we can see how multiplying the input to the sine function squashes the output into the desired wavelength. I'll call this parameter squash and I'll lock its range to 0 to 1. And then I can use the lerp function to linearly interpolate between the 2 times pi value and 1, which will give us the original unmodified input. Now we've got the wave producing peaks at whole number intervals, we can now divide that input by the desired wavelength. In this case, I'll choose 2 meters, so that the peaks line up with what we have specified as our wavelength. We can even add a control for this as well, and we'll call it wavelength. Now just for a second, I'm going to set the squash back to zero, which is effectively setting the wavelength back to two times pi. Bear with me, because this simplifies matters for now, and we'll set it back to a specific wavelength once we've covered this next topic. So far, our waves have been at a fixed minimum and maximum height, which is the min and max output of the sine function, which is negative one to one. So let's add another control called height and use that as a multiplier on the y value. So we could, for example, set it to 0.5 meters. I'm going to set that back to 1 for now, as we're going to be tackling another aspect of the look of the ocean waves, which is their characteristic peaks. So we have a single wave travelling with a particular wavelength at a particular speed, but it doesn't look much like a real wave yet. The sine wave looks quite round, and if you look at the pictures of waves, they tend to have a characteristic peak. Doing a quick image search, and I'll make sure to choose the right usage settings so I'm allowed to show this, we can see images like this. Well, the way Gerstner waves achieves that is by affecting the horizontal movement of the wave. So far, we've only been affecting the wave height by moving our reference plane up and down. If we move the part of the wave on the right of the low point of the trough towards the peaks a little bit, but keep the lowest and the peak itself fixed, we could achieve this nice peak shape. The same goes for the other side of the sine wave. We want to move the points in the negative direction. There is a mathematical function we can use to do that. We want a function that oscillates between positive and negative in a similar way to the sine wave. And you might be tempted to use the sine wave again. And that's almost exactly what we want. But we want a wave that is offset from the sine wave. If we plot the desired amount that we want to move, then we realise that this is a cosine wave. If we overlay the cosine wave on top of our current wave, then we see that because it's offset by one quarter period, then the positive values causes the part of the left side of the main wave to move in from the left, and then the negative parts of the cosine wave cause the right side of the sine wave to move to the left. And where the peak is, the cosine wave has a value of zero, and so it doesn't move at all. And as a side note, this shows one of the trigonometric identities, specifically that sine of x equals cosine of pi over 2 minus x. See the Wikipedia article for more information. So let's offset the points with the cosine wave. We see that we get the desired peak. But if we move the timeline forward, we see that the horizontal component doesn't appear to travel with the wave. So we need to also use the time offset. 
and use it as an offset into the input of the cosine function, the same as we did with the original sine wave. Now we see that we get the cosine peak to travel with the wave. Another side note is that I think the shape we accidentally achieved by not using time in the input of the cosine wave was pretty cool, and we might be able to use that in the future as an extra parameter to give the wave some forward bias in its travelling direction by adding a little bit to the horizontal cosine part of the wave. We'll now add a parameter to control this peak effect, and we'll call it peak, and it simply scales this cosine offset to effectively blend between the simple sine wave and the full peak cosine wave. Looking at the vector of where the point's original position is, we can see that the points aren't actually travelling with the wave, they're just moving in a circle. And this makes sense when you look at the mathematical expression, which turns out is the same as moving a point around a circle. If you're interested, you can see my other video, which illustrates this a bit more clearer. The peaks are appearing on different points at different times, and that makes it look like the points are travelling. But the points are staying relatively where they are. They are the medium through which the wave is carried, and we, in the end, see a wave when we take a step back and look at the results that arises from this behaviour. I think it's pretty cool, and shows how our visual system filters out information to show us emergent behaviour. This is basically the idea behind the trochoidal wave, which is another name for Gerstner wave. I've got a link to the Wikipedia entry for this in the description. Now, let's set the wavelength back to our desired wavelength of 1 meter by turning our squash parameter back to 1. What's happening here? We see that our ocean looks like a slinky or concertina. Why could this be happening? It's because we're offsetting in the horizontal direction, but the amount that we're offsetting is the full amount of the cosine function, which is minus 1 to 1. This was fine when our inputs to the sine and cosine were at the standard period of multiples of pi, but we have a different wavelength, and so the distance between peaks doesn't match up with what's being fed as input to the function. What we want to do is scale the horizontal offset so that the amount that is offsetted by fits within the peaks that it's surrounded by. That means we should also divide the offset by the 2 times pi times wavelength factor, so that the horizontal cycle is the same as the vertical one. And here we see another problem. Our wave looks like it's looping over itself. We'll get to fixing this promptly, but first I notice that we have a 2 times pi over wavelength and both the x and y components. Let's take this out and store it in a variable called wave number. Wave number is a term used to mean waves per unit distance. Frequency generally refers to how often something appears in time. The wave number is just like frequency, but it means how often something appears across some distance. And here's the Wikipedia entry for wave number, and I've left that in the description as well. We also don't need the squash parameter anymore, so let's remove that to make it a bit more readable. So back to the looping. The reason that it's looping is because the amount that the points were offset in the horizontal direction was correct when the wavelength was 2 times pi. But now the distance between peaks is less, so we need to move the points less. In the previous section, we corrected the cycle of the cosine wave, which meant correcting the input to the cosine function. Now we're correcting the output, which is negative 1 to 1. We can simply divide the horizontal offset by the wave number to prevent any loop over. So far, we've been adding up sine and cosine waves, which seems to be getting us on the right track towards some physically plausible ocean waves. We haven't yet, though, considered how fast these waves are travelling. Water obviously obeys some kind of physical laws, so there must be something we can do to state the speed of these waves. We currently have this time offset to make the waves move at a certain speed, but it's not physical by any means. The GPU Gems article itself references a famous paper by a guy called Jerry Tessendorf. That paper takes an approach to water waves, which uses the fast Fourier transform to state how the ocean appears in terms of frequency distribution. That's different in how we approach it, as we are explicitly just adding up waves and setting the frequency of each one. The paper does mention dispersion, or frequency dispersion, which is a term that basically means that waves of different wavelengths travel at different speeds. The Wikipedia article on dispersion goes into a lot more detail than that, which you can find the link for in the description. For open ocean waves, the speed at which waves travel can be approximated with a simple relation. It is that the speed of the wave is the square root of gravity divided by the wave number. And a side note, 
The GPU Gems article shows it as gravity multiplied by the wave number. I think this might be incorrect, as the Wikipedia entry and another blog post I read showed it as gravity divided by wave number. But if I'm wrong, then please let me know. So we've been doing all this multiplying and offsetting in the argument to the sine and cosine functions themselves. So what if we want to have more than one wave at a time? One way we can do that is to store the height and horizontal offsets into a separate accumulation variable, and then at the end, set the height and offset of the x and y components of the geometry once. So let's create this offset variable and initialize it to zero so that there is no offset at the beginning. Then we add that offset to the position variable. No real difference so far, but now we can start to implement the multiple waves by accumulating into that single offset variable. Now for our multiple waves, we need to add them together. In mathematical notation, we use the sum notation, and for the code, we'll simply use a for loop. We'll need an extra parameter as well, so we know how many waves we want. Right now, if we increase this number of waves variable, then we don't get anything that looks very nice because we're adding the same wave on top of itself and it's looping over due to the horizontal offset going over the distance between peaks issue that we encountered earlier. Because in each loop iteration, we're adding to the horizontal offset causing the looping, we want to divide the peak component by the number of waves to ensure that the total offset never goes beyond the largest peak. We'll separate out that value as well into a variable called q, which is what the GPU Gems article calls it. And this q calculation differs very slightly from the GPU Gems article in that it doesn't multiply by height. I notice that there's a multiplication by height in the horizontal offsets. This multiplication was cancelling out the division in the q calculation, so I simply removed both. I saw no difference between it being there and not, and if I'm wrong, then please leave a comment and I'll address it. So what's the point of having the same wave piled on top of itself? Real ocean waves are made up of multiple waves of all different wavelengths and heights. We haven't made a physical relationship between wavelength and height like we did with wavelength and speed, as the GPU Gems article doesn't either. We leave that as an artistic control. So we want to be able to specify that each wave has a different wavelength and speed. We'll start with our height variable, store it in an initial variable, and then each loop iteration, after we have used the current value, we will divide it by some user-defined ratio, which we'll also create a parameter for. So each iteration, if it will be decreased, and for the wave number, we want to multiply it to make it more frequent. Also, because the speed is dependent on the wavelength, which is inside a square root function, we need to put the speed calculation inside the loop. Now when we add more waves, the waves get smaller in height and distance apart, depending on the ratio provided. This is all very exciting, but we want to be able to do an ocean surface in 3D now. The first thing we need is the right geometry to be able to operate on. So in Houdini, it's easy to create a flat 2D grid that we can set the height and then offset horizontally in both the x and z directions, as opposed to just one direction. If you're doing this in another program, or 3D engine, then you'll need a 3D model. And if you're having trouble creating or finding one, then you can find one in the asset bundle from the link in the description. We know how to do waves in a particular direction using the x-axis, but we want to be able to have waves travel in any arbitrary direction. So far, the only things we have available to us are the x-position of the points, and also the z position. But what we want to do is to be able to specify a direction and have all the points have some attribute that increases in value along that direction as if it was some other hidden axis. First, we'll specify a vector which represents the direction we want to travel in. We can do that inside each loop with a rand function to generate random values for the x and z components. Then we'll normalize this to get a unit vector. Then to get this increasing value along the direction vector, 
we'll want to project the position of the point onto that vector and measure how far along the direction vector it lands perpendicular to it. We should remember that each point represents a vector from the origin as well. So which operation can take one vector and project it to see how far along another vector it is? The operation that can do that for us is the dot product. When the direction vector is a unit vector, the result is a scalar or float value of how much along the length of the direction vector the position projects onto. If we do this for all points along the grid, then we get an infinite gradient in that direction. And there's one small thing we want to avoid. When we project the position of the point against the direction vector, we are projecting the 3D position of the points against a 2D direction vector. But what if our grid is not at a Y value of zero, or C level if you'd like? We want to only project the X and Z components of our grid against the direction vector. So that way we ignore the height of the grid. This can now be visualized by temporarily injecting that projected length into the color channel and multiplying it down to see the gradient as the value increases quite quickly. There are a couple of things we want to do at this stage. We want to use the projected position length as the input to the sine function to make our wave appear to travel in that direction. Then we want to put in the cosine wave into the Z component of the offset. It was previously just in the X component for the 2D case. Also, we should only offset horizontally by the amount that it's pointing in the direction of the direction vector. Since the direction vector is a unit vector, we can multiply by the component directly. So if the direction vector is pointing directly down the X axis, then only the X component will get a cosine offset. And similarly for the Z component. But if the direction vector is perfectly diagonal, then both components will get a 50-50 blend between them is effectively acting as a mask. And we'll also take out that color preview. And that is pretty much the fundamentals of Gerstner waves covered. Here I've added a UV quick shade node, which has this default checker pattern texture, which makes it easier to see what's happening to our geometry. And we could even apply a basic ocean water texture for a bit of fun, and I've provided one in the description. In 3D rendering, we usually need to shade and light the geometry to either make it look like it exists in the real world or give it some stylized hyperreal look. Rendering algorithms, which are often implemented as surface shaders, usually make use of normals, which are surface orientation vectors. These are used to, for example, work out if the surface is pointing away or towards a light and hence how much light it receives. But because our geometry doesn't have the correct normal vectors, the shaders can't calculate the correct shading based on the angle that the faces are to the light. Houdini can calculate the normals based on the geometry after the positions have been calculated. But if we're running this in a real-time GPU shader, then we want to be able to calculate the normals. As we know, the normal is a vector that represents the surface orientation. One way of doing that is to calculate the two vectors that represent the slope of the geometry in the x and z directions independently, and then take the cross product of those two vectors to give the normal. A technique to approximate the slope, which is actually the derivative of the function used to manipulate our geometry in the x or y direction, is to use the neighboring points to find out how much the height has increased or decreased in the specified distance. This is the known rise over run concept, and it's one of the ways that Houdini can calculate the normals. In our case though, we're potentially calculating this in a shader and don't have access to the neighboring point positions. So how do we calculate the normals? Well, we can take advantage of the fact that the positions are calculated using a Gerstner wave function, and functions themselves are differentiable. So all we have to do is differentiate our Gerstner wave function to get a function for the normals directly. You might think that because we're using sums and loops, that it makes it more difficult to differentiate the multiple Gerstner wave functions that are added together. But don't worry, there's an interesting property of derivatives that the sum of function derivatives is the same as the derivatives of a sum of functions. If you want to know more about this, then just search for the sum rule for derivatives on the internet. The GPU Gems article doesn't show the derivation or working out of the derivatives, and I won't either, but I think we can trust that they give the right results, and it's sufficient to understand the overall concept. When we calculate the normals, we notice that there's a part of the equation that is the input to the sine and cosine functions which is the same. We also see that the same sine and cosine functions are used for the positional calculation as well. So let's pull those out and put them in their own variables. First I'll pull up the input to the sine and cosine functions, which I'll call phase. 
then I'll create separate variables for the sine and cosine functions so we can reuse them in the normal calculation. We'll be calculating the tangent and bitangent vectors, which are these partial derivatives that we mentioned before. These are the slopes of the position function with respect to each input to the function, each direction. If this doesn't make any sense yet, then you'll visually see what they look like soon, and hopefully that will make sense. But as I mentioned, these are partial derivatives, and I suggest you watch some of 3Blue1Brown's videos on Khan Academy on partial derivatives of vector valued functions with vector outputs. So we'll create local variables outside of the loop so that we can accumulate the bitangent, tangent, and normal, just like we did with the position offset. Since the final tangent and bitangent have these 1 minus and negated parts, We'll start off with values of 1, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 1, which are the unit vectors in the x and z directions. And then we'll cumulatively subtract just the sum part, which gives us the same result as doing it after the loop. Let's temporarily look at the tangent and bitangent vectors mainly to illustrate how they can be used to get the surface orientation. If we set the tangent as the normal and preview them in the display without lighting, then we can see that we get a vector which represents how the function is changing in the x direction. Similarly, we can view the same change in the z direction. Now, the cross product of these vectors should give us the normal that sticks out of the surface of the mesh. For some reason, the equation for the normals that were in the GPU Gems article was giving incorrect results for me. Again, it could be something I've done wrong, but I found that by computing the cross product between the tangent and bitangent vectors gave me the same results as the Houdini normal calculation, at least for low wave numbers, and more on that in a moment. So let's go back and set the normals to be the ones that we've calculated. We'll store it in the Houdini special predefined attribute for normals, which is this n variable, which we can access with the at symbol. One thing to be very careful of is using this normal calculation when we have high numbers of waves added together. I found that the derivatives can add up and look very noisy. While I can't be sure, I think it's due to aliasing of the function being evaluated directly at the point. It's perfectly possible that I'm doing something wrong, but the dozens of other Gerstner wave implementations I found all look the same. And the GPU GEMS article itself does even mention that you shouldn't use wavelengths that are smaller than the resolution of your grid, because then artifacts can appear. Houdini's normal calculation doesn't suffer from this, probably because it's using finite difference approximation, which tends to blur out these issues. Using a smooth node on the normal attribute gives us similar results to the normal node's results, so I'm happy that this is doing the right thing. Basically, you want to be careful to not have waves that are smaller than the grid resolution. The GPU Gems article discusses a further approach on top of this called texture waves, which use the pixel shader to calculate extra normals at the pixel level, to achieve the effect of small waves, and this is done as a lighting effect, as opposed to the vertex level here, which is a geometric effect. I might explore this technique, which could be a future video. So there we are, we have the basic shapes and normals for the ocean surface, and the next step would be to make it look more like an ocean surface. I think that's better left in a separate video. To be honest, there are a variety of different ways we could approach this, that each could have their own video. So I'm going to just leave this basic texture on, and call this video done. If you want to see further videos where we tackle things like foam, refraction, and adding textures, or even if you have general questions on things that weren't clear, then please let me know in the comments. And as always, it really helps if you subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching, and see you soon.